congratulations to the organizing committee for this phenomenal event. And all the compliments to the, to the students and the organizing committee. I, I love the word uh, serial entrepreneur. Uh, I never heard that before. I always consider myself as a humble teacher uh, in front of the classroom, in front of the students, in front of their parents sometimes. And I keep asking myself the same question as Jean Petit is how can we facilitate teaching? How can we facilitate learning? As a professor, you sometimes are more focused on just deliver the stuff and do your song and dance and leave the auditorium and hopefully the students enjoy your, your as an individual and give you good grading. But more and more as I get the older and probably fatter and bolder, I start thinking more about what is the outcome of teaching? You know, what is the outcome when I leave the auditorium? What is left? What is mean really impacting the students? So that took me a little bit into the field of MOOC or the online mass online training of courses, and I just want to share a couple of thoughts about that and I, in, in my heart, and so I'm really passionate about this. I'm also a little bit petrified of it because it means I need to innovate, but I saw it just to focus here. Since we're in a business school, I just want to open with a quote that we very often use in our lecture and lecture halls, and I do it in my own teaching in the service marketing or service innovation course, and I start off with, if you don't innovate, you die, which is kind of dramatic. But I think the logic is that if you, if you don't innovate, you're, you're standing still. And when you're standing still, you're collecting dust. And when you're collecting dust, uh, the law of gravity in business kicks in. The two-step approach to gravity in business kicks in. So the first step in business is that you, you lose your competitive edge in, in business and you kind of move backward in, 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 in the race. And you stay there, and the other guys innovate, and you keep dropping back, and at the end of it, you're at the end of the, the race. And then you fall off the cliff, and you, you die, or you go bankrupt. And this seems to be the story of most businesses. And one good point in, could be Kodak, an awesome company created back in 1850-something and went bankrupt May last year. The Kodak moment, frozen time. They forgot to innovate. But if innovation is, if you don't innovate, and if that is fatal not to innovate, I would claim that academia, which I come from, is on deathbed, infected by MOOC, mass open online courses. And if you don't do anything about it without relating to it, somebody else will do the job better than we do, and we need to do something with it. But before we write the obituary of academia 1.0, Let's take one step back and where I, f I feel I start getting passionate about it. This is a picture taken from, by of some students in Guinea. And they are at the airport, studying under the lights of the light bulbs or light poles at the parking lot there. Electricity is rationed. It's hard to get by. 5% of the community has it. It's very irregular. So they're forced to go to the airport because that's where the light is for the parking and the security of the cars. They would keep on studying until the last Air France flight has landed by midnight. Then lights are out, and they have to stop studying. And for some, it means they have to walk home for several miles. But they can come back next day, waiting for the next Air France to arrive, and keep on studying. It's a paradox that while electricity is a hundred-year-old technology, it's rationed in this country. More modern technology like smartphones or tablets are more readily available. And if you focus on one of the students here, I don't know this person, we can call him Charles, we can call him Tim. But I guess if we walk up to him and we ask him, do you have a smartphone? I guess his immediate response would be to get in there and flip up his five, probably S, or could be a C, if there was a color. So with a smartphone, Tim or Charles could access the best of the best education in the world from home. He wouldn't have to walk the five miles or ten miles or bicycling to get to the airport and the parking lot and wait for Air France to land, and then go home again. So this is interesting, because people in countries like Guinea or students like that in those in, in developing countries, getting access to education and the best education they can through using modern technology, 
would mean a ticket out of unemployment. It would mean a ticket to get starting in your life, to get access to the welfare that we so much enjoy in the rest of the world. So I think MOOC will be a blessing for students in the developing world, in the third world, if we want to call it. Let's look at the old model, the one I'm the fruit of, I'm the victim of. I profess, because I'm a professor. I have colleagues that are assistant professors, they assist me. I have colleagues that are associate professors, and I believe they are associated to me, or with me. But I profess. So that's the old model. I talk, students take note, or pretend to take note. They fight to stay alive, without falling asleep. And I try the best I can do to do my pony and trick show, to keep them alive. But the logic is that I am the bridge between academia, or the knowledge, or the library, and the empty student head. Through my lectures and going through my notes and try to focus on what's difficult, I'm trying to be the bridge between the student and the knowledge. The students are working hard to stay alive, as Jean-Claude said, to not fall asleep. They stay alive in my lectures. When they're done, they walk out of the dull lecture, the dull auditorium, walk over to the even duller library, and read from books, study from books. When they're done, they walk down to the cafeteria, cafeteria, the cafeteria and they eat the dull food. After the dull dinner, they go back to the dull dorms, and they keep on reading from the dull books. The good news is, next day will be the same. <laughs> the even better news is, for the next four to six years. So there's a huge challenge of just keeping the interest of the students to keep the focus on the old academia one on technology. Because the deans are pursuing the same strategy, they want to get climb on the Financial Times ranking, they want to be the best of the best. They seem to be pursuing the same strategy, hire the, uh, the best talented faculty members you can find. Well, the good news for me is that salary keeps cre increasing. That's the very good news. The very bad news is that because of the cost of salary increasing in academia, so phenomenally, the cost of tuition is just going through the ceiling. And when we see smart deans and rectors and oh, deans start I mean, chasing talented students, so not only the talented faculty members, but also the talented students through scholarships, and also the really, really, really creative ones start I mean, improving the campus, and having lunch and swimming pool and nice dorms, the cost of education just goes through the ceiling. My point being that now, today, education, higher education, is limited to the very few fortunate students who can afford it and get good grades enough to get into the good universities and thereby get a ticket to the good life. This is very undemocratic. Very undemocratic. If you look at the cost of study in the United States, it's in fact higher than the collective sum of car loans in the United States. The bad news is that a lot of students find hard to get a job because of the decline in the economy, thereby forcing them home to their parents because they cannot get a job, start paying down the loans, so the starting point in life is not very good. This is the old business model. Not only that, but if you look into the future, there's a report by McKinsey that takes us into how countries develop from farming and fishing and hunting into industry and manufacturing and into services. It seems to be the path of all countries around the world. China, India. It's, not, it's what Tom Friedman in his book, The World is Fat, said. It's not a race down the value chain but it's a race up the value chain. Everybody wants to go up, go up to the more sophisticated product or services. That means that people with lower skills do not get access to the jobs in the future because they will require higher skills and competences. In fact, the old manufacturing plants that used to suck up thousands of people will cease to exist. The average size of a service company in a competence-based service company is somewhere between 50 and 100 employees. 
what do you do with those who do not have the skills and talents to get employed by the service companies or the competence-based companies? So for a society reason, we need to educate more people to make them qualified for these jobs. Because the ones with the lower skills are not going to be around anymore unless you want to move to other parts of the world. Which forces us, and my business specifically, to start thinking dramatically about our business model. We need to move away from the one professor in the classroom to the one professor that can relate to thousands of students. Efficiently, affordable, and we need to do it quickly. We need to do it quickly. So welcome to Academia 2.0. And this is where I see colleagues of mine struggling, I see deans struggling, because they're struggling getting their heads and hands around it. What the heck does it mean? I'm sure you're familiar with the numbers here in Khan Academy, a phenomenal one. I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm myself enrolled as a student there just to play around with the technology. I'm telling you, this is good stuff. It's a phenomenal teacher, phenomenal teacher. 4,700 video clips on YouTube is available. 260 million sessions has been shown since 2006. 260 million sessions have been shown since 2006. Coursera is, a, is a, 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 an, also an, an online, free online course, or a program, a portal, I guess, um, created by two Stanford professors. Um, and what they do is basically tap into Princeton, um, to Wharton, to other fine universities, and they take their online courses after an agreement and offer them under the headline Coursera. So you can imagine any topic would be available. So that means you can sit in Conakry Airport in Guinea with your small smartphone and study at Princeton. That's an awesome thought. That's an awesome thought. edX is a joint venture between MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Harvard specifically targeted higher education. They have 1.2 million users. I forgot to mention Coursera have 4 million users. And finally, we have an oddity called Udacity. It's a paid service. You need to pay to get enrolled there. Again, there's the two Stanford professors that created it, and it's primarily in computer science. 400,000 students enrolled. So we're talking about 260 million sessions at Khan. We're talking about 4 million users at um, Coursera, 1.2 million at uh, edX, and then 400,000. This is just mind-blowing how I mean, people can get access to education and people who cannot afford to go to the Ivy Leagues. So this is the Academia 2.0, and we need to relate to it. The thing I like about it is that we are now moving from um, what I call here the time served at Norwegian School of Economics to the stuff you have learned while you were here. So it's not necessarily the brand, but also what you can know, but we need to um, uh, differentiate between the different levels here. So the two issues here that I just want to raise to you, and then a practical problem. So if people or students do not have to come to campuses anymore to learn, what is the importance of campus? Why would anybody hire a campus and a professor to get a job done. What is that you want to accomplish? And second, what is the job of the professors in the future? These are dramatic things, and we need to think about it. We know that Stern School, Harvard, MIT, Wharton have invested tons of money in a campus. Who wants to use it in the future? Who wants to pay at Harvard $75,000 a year for tuition fee to walk in the parks they call it campuses? For practical issues, what about grading? How do you grade thousands and thousands and thousands of students? How do you handle the student interaction or the instructor interaction when there are thousands and thousands of students out there? How do you um, deal with cheating? And finally, what do we do with student retention? So even though a MOOC is very nice and sexy and, sex and, sexy and a low-level entrance offer, nine or 5% of the students are retained. That's awesome. You know, if I start off with a class with 100 students and five were there at the end of it, I would probably get sacked by the dean of the school. So we need to deal with that. My point here is that MOOC for higher education has the same impact as a 
tablet or in smartphone had for the newspapers. As Amazon had an impact on the bookstores and most of shops around the world, like iPhone or Apple disrupted Nokia, MOOC will disrupt academia. So there will be three types of deans in this transition period. There will be the deans who make it happen. There will be the deans who see what's happening. And finally, there will be the deans who wondered what the heck happened. And for the latter category, I'm concerned. And I will guess, and my prediction is, that several universities, and particularly the smaller ones, will go bankrupt. They will disappear. And that's going to be a challenge. If we don't innovate, you will die, I said in the beginning. I also said that academia today is on a deathbed. If deans don't get their head around MOOC and what they're going to do with it, they're going to improve and innovate our main service, namely teaching, I'm afraid we're going to move from deathbed to the next stage. And in the obituary and on the tombstone, future students will read, they simply didn't get it. Thank you so much.